Good morning, King's Church, Cockermouth. It's um, great to be together. If not in person, we are together in uh, via YouTube or via Zoom, or I know some of you catch up on a DVD. However you are viewing us and joining us, uh, it's great and you're very welcome. If you are a visitor looking in today, and I know recently we have had some visitors. In fact, I spoke to one only the other day. Um, you are particularly welcome and we are privileged you are joining us this morning. Back in the 60s, when I was only a young man, or well, child actually, um, there used to be a programme called That Was A Week That Was. Some of you may even remember it or even remember the title. It was a satirical, humorous programme about what, what has happened during the week. Well, I guess this week we've all lived through, you could title it, well, that was the week that was. Huge news headlines from across the world, some joyous, some not so joyous. Um, schools went back this week and again, um, huge step forward in the kind of recovery out or getting back to normal, uh, getting our lives back into normal, the schools going back. Vaccination program reeling out now. Uh, I think about 25 million of us have been had our first vaccination. <clears throat> and I do know that some of us, even here in Cockermouth, have had their second vac vaccination, which is excellent news. But however your week has been, the highs and the lows, um, it's, it's good just to come together on a Sunday and leave the week behind us. That's gone now. Let's just come together via the, via the cameras and be together and just give thanks to God for his faithfulness this week. Paul is going to start by leading us in a great, uh, well-known hymn. So, Paul, over to you. Oh, 
so Thank you, Paul. It's always good to be reminded of these great old songs. Wonderful. Um, now it's interview time. And Joel, who do we have in the interview chair today? Good morning. This morning I have Jane Charman with us and we'll explain who she is a bit later on. Morning, Jane. Good morning, Joel. So we're going to start with your this or that questions. The first one is coffee or tea? Coffee. Definitely. Industrial strength, please. Summer or winter? I'm a summer person. Yes, I love the hot weather. Cake or chocolate? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to make it chocolate because I can take that out walking with me when I go fell walking. Always handy. And a pet lizard or a pet spider? Oh, uh, that's a tough one too. Um, Oh, I, I used to have a pet spider and uh, we were quite good mates. So, uh, yeah, I'll go for spider. Thank you. Fantastic. So, so you moved to Cockermouth in November to be the rector for the Anglican churches in Cockermouth area. And you head up the local mission community, um, which is a lot of titles. So what does the job entail? OK, so I'm team rector of the Cockermouth area churches. There's four churches. Uh, the two in Cockermouth, All Saints and Christchurch, then St Bridget's Brykirk and um, Christchurch Great Broughton. That's a close group. But I also have uh, oversight of another seven churches. Uh, it's Lawton, Lowswater and Buttermere, Brigham, Clifton, Dean and Mossa. Uh, what does the job entail? Uh, well, it, it's completely different from what a parish priest job would have been even 20 years ago, because I can't be the parish priest of 11 different parishes. So my job is to encourage those churches, um, to draw out the gifts of people, uh, to create lay leadership teams so that all those churches can continue to have uh, a simple, sustainable Christian life in the midst of their communities. That's what I Fantastic. think. Fantastic. Wow. It's a big job, though, with a lot of churches and a lot of people to oversee. Yeah. It's 86 square miles, the patch. Wow. So what are you enjoying about your new role? So, I mean, these are strange times, obviously, because I moved here at the end of November and we've been pretty much under restrictions or lockdown for all of that time. So I don't think the experience I'm having at the moment is typical. Uh, but the thing that I've, I've started to enjoy um, and, and have looked forward to and was the reason why I wanted to come to this job is that um, I'm back in uh, I'm back in parish ministry if you like my previous job was quite a managerial job it was a teaching and training job so I didn't do things like preach or uh, take baptisms weddings and funerals and those are the things that I'm starting to enjoy and really looking forward to in the role. Brilliant so Thinking about our church then, what is one thing that's really helped you in your Christian journey that you think might help the children and young people at our church? It's a really good question. Um, I think that there aren't many good things about growing older, but I think one of the good things is that you can look back and see how God was at work in your life over a period of time. And I think when you're young and stuff happens, like you fail at something that you really wanted to succeed at or a friendship breaks up, you think, right, that's it. Nothing can ever come good again. And, and you try to trust, and you try to pray, but you just don't have that experience of, of knowing that you will come through it and that the sun will come out again. So I think um, it's, it's that, you know, Keep praying, keep trusting, and you will look back and see that um, God was at work in your life, even if you can't see it at the moment. Um, and there's, there's a, a scripture that I really love, um, which is Psalm 30, verse 5. 
Um, God's anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. That's really helped me. Great advice. So what would you like our church to be praying for you at the moment? I would be really grateful if you would pray that God will give me the gifts of leadership that I need in this role. Um, and in particular, that he will give me so that I can give other people a spirit of encouragement, because I think that is so important in ministry. So please pray um, that I will be encouraged so that I can encourage other people. What a great thing to be praying for. So if you've enjoyed the interview today or you've got any questions, please get in contact at pastoral at kingcc.org. Jane, it's been lovely to meet you and we look forward to hopefully getting to meet you when we're allowed to. Um, thank you very much for giving us the time. Thank you. And I do look forward to meeting you in person as soon as we can. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Joelle, and thank you, Jane. It's great to have you in Cockermouth, and I look forward to working with you at being part of God's church here in the town. Great, and I hope you've really felt welcomed by the town in the few months you've been here. You did mention two things that we could pray for you, and I'd like to pray for you now. I don't know if you're listening to this, but that doesn't matter. We'd like to pray for you, because you, your role is key in our in our town in our in our villages you ask for prayer for the gift of leadership and for the spirit of encouragement so i'm going to pray for you now and king's church let's just let's get behind this in prayer father we thank you for jane charman coming to be with us father i pray that you would bless her bless her in all she does and i pray lord that you would uh, help her in her leadership role in this vast parish that she has responsibility for. Father, I pray that, that you would give her great leadership skills, that she would gather people to her. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would not only encourage her, but she would be a great encouragement to many. And she would impart that spirit of encouragement in, the, in these days and in our parish. Father, I pray that you bless her and uh, thank you for uh, sending her to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now, before we move on to some more worship, children, uh, the grown-up or grown-ups in your household would have received an email, and in that email there were there is some activities, there's some colouring, there's a uh, word search, uh, there's some questions that you can answer. So while you're getting that ready. The grown-ups are going to be worshipping again. Uh, Paul, lead us in worship. Thank you.
Jesus come Holy Spirit come Let the king of my heart be the man 
the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, for you are good, good. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, now in our meeting, it's time for us to look into the Word of God, into the Bible, and it's our privilege to have Roger speaking to us today. So, Roger, over to you. Hi, everyone. It's just been great being together this morning, and uh, and it's my privilege to open the Bible and for us to learn together uh, in our journey through Acts. But before I do that, I just want to take this opportunity to pray for all the ladies in the church. Uh, we so value you in all that you are and all that you do. Uh, we value all your friendship. Uh, we value you uh, as mothers within the church. We value you as sisters. We value you uh, as workers as well. You all carry so many different responsibilities and, and are just so faithful in all that you do. We so appreciate you. And I'm just going to pray for you, but before I do, I'm going to read a verse. And it's an interesting verse. It's when Paul writes at the end of uh, his letter to the Roman church, and he says this, he says this, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who's been a mother to me too. It just intrigues me that verse, and I think there's quite a story behind it of, of Paul being blessed by Rufus's mother, and uh, and it just speaks, doesn't it, of, of just the wider call to motherhood. So we so appreciate all of you, and uh, God bless you, and let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this uh, 
Even this first law, which uh, speaks of an unnamed lady who had mighty impact, even on the Apostle Paul, what he felt, what he appreciated, what he valued uh, in, in what this lady brought. Lord, we just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for all the women in the church that just are so faithful in so many different ways, whether it's praying, caring, uh, such example of godly lives, so many, many ways. And Lord, we just pray now that your blessing will be on each and every one. Father, just pour your grace freshly on them, refresh them, encourage their hearts, strengthen them. And Lord, we thank you for them in the name of Jesus. Amen. OK, so we're taking this journey through Acts at the moment and we've uh, compared it to be to like one of these great train journeys you can see on the TV where you travel through a lot of distance and, and then you stop, you get out of the station and you explore both the history of that place, but also sometimes the relevance of that place to today. And today we get out at Antioch. It's a bustling city. It was, the, uh, it was the capital of the Roman province of Syria at its time. It was the third largest city uh, in those days. There was Rome, there's Alexandria, there's Antioch, a population of about half a million. And it was there that some believers had been scattered to. If you remember back in Acts chapter 8, we read about the, the great persecution that broke out. And as a result of that, many believers just went all over to different uh, nations, different places, and some found themselves in Antioch. I, I just want to press the pause button at that point. Uh, and it's good to reflect on that, isn't it? If you go back to Acts 8, you find the chief perpetrator of that persecution was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Well, as we read this story and we focus on Antioch, it's fascinating that there's a, a, that Saul of Tarsus again appears, but in a very, very different role. And in itself, that tells a very profound story. So, Antioch. Uh, it's a significant city, and actually we're going to read about a significant church that, that, that was started there and that grew there with an impact way beyond the city itself. We don't live in a large city. Okay, Cockermouth is a small town. But I believe passionately that God has called us to be a significant church. And he's called us to an influence that is to impact the, the, the town, the villages, this part of West Cumbria, but beyond, even to other nations. And I believe this, as we look at this church, we can really capture a vision of being church for our times. So what we're going to do is read the story and then we're going to pick up some of the highlights of this church. So Acts chapter 11 and verse 19 to 30. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and they began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their heart. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus 
to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and they taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up, and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas, and so. Okay, so what we see here, first of all, is a, a church that heard a message. In fact, it was a church of word and spirit. Throughout the story of Acts so far, the kingdom of God has been advancing. People are being saved. Churches are, are being started. And it's all because of, of a message. It's good news. It, it's the good news about the Lord Jesus. This story, the story of Jesus, it is being told again and again, and wherever these believers are scattered to, they, they tell this story and people get saved. This is so basic for us to see, but it's so important we get this. It's so profound, it's, it's what we're here for. It's how the kingdom advances. We are carriers of this good news about Jesus. We have a message to share. And it's fascinating in this story that God even uses difficult circumstances. He's scattered the believers and here they are. He's using circumstances to fulfill his promises. Okay, they were being witnesses, not just to Judea, not just to Samaria, but to the ends of the earth and to other nations. And it really is good news. It's good to be reminded. We, our lives are built on this foundation. It's good news. Our sins are forgiven. Our past has been dealt with. We're made clean. We have an eternity that is secure, we're, we're given new life. That new life is resurrection life. Death has been overcome. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. We, we have inherited immortal life. This is good, good news that we receive through Jesus and it's freely given. We don't deserve it, in fact, what we deserve is the exact opposite. The wages of sin is death. And yet we're given the very best. Jesus has paid the price. He paid the bill, literally. And now, today, we can know God's joy. We can know his peace. We can know his love. We've got a certain and secure hope that no one, nothing, can rub us off, uh, rub us? Rub us off, <laughs> okay? We don't deserve anything, yet God's given us everything. This is the good news about Jesus. Please hear this. If you're uh, tuned in to our meeting today and perhaps you, 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 know, you haven't yet come to faith in Jesus, hear this. It's good news. In this world where we've been bombarded by bad news, difficult news, sad news, challenging news. The Christian message is good news. You can receive it. You can receive it today. It's a message. But as well as that, it's a demonstration of God's power. You read that phrase that the, Lord, the, the Lord's hand was with them. And that's actually a biblical phrase, and it, it's a, it means the power of God was at work. God's presence, God's power was tangible. It was both word and spirit together. That's our passion as church. We have a message to share. We have words to say. 
But actually, we want to see that breakthrough of the presence of God. It's the story of Acts all the way through. And it's a story that continues into church for our times. We pray for it. Let's expect it. Let's ask God for boldness to speak the words, to share the message. God will position us in that. He will use circumstances to get us where he wants to, where he wants us. But once we're there, let's not hold back. Let's be challenged by this. Let's learn to speak out the message. Let's be bringers of good news. But let's say, God, would you break through with power as well? Let's see signs and wonders, you touching lives. It was a church of word and spirit. But it was a church of the grace of God. And I, I love the phrase, Barnabas saw what the grace of God had done. He saw something. That this message, the good news of Jesus, is about the grace of God. And there's evidence of it. It's visible. It's recognisable. You know, it's not that Barnabas went there and he saw a kind of a, a, a list of beliefs, almost like a statement of faith on the, uh, on the building wall. And thought, yeah, OK, they're, you know, that's sound. Now, don't mishear me. Statements of faith are important. I value them hugely. But, Paul, uh, but Barnabas saw something in their lives. He saw changed lives. A great number of people believed and turned to the, uh, turned to the Lord. This is what grace does. It changes lives. It transforms us from sinners, wracked with guilt, condemned, and it makes us free. It's changed. That's the grace of God. And that freedom, it brings joy. So Barnabas is glad. It, it, it makes his heart sing. He sees, yeah, God's at work here. This really is, it's, it's, this is the handiwork of Jesus. It, it, it's almost like elsewhere, in fact, Paul writes about the church in Corinth as being a letter that other people can read that tells what Jesus has done for them. And this is what Barnabas is saying here, He's saying, yeah, I can read. God's done a great work in your lives. You know, legalism, it, it traps us in the miserableness of our own efforts, our own failure. Actually, it, can, it continues to trap us to guilt. It doesn't give us the answer for that. But grace frees us. It brings joy. It's all about his work. It's all about Jesus, his success. So you see the grace of God in changed lives. You see it in joy. But also, you see it by a people devoted to Jesus. Barnabas encourages them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. You see, this is what true grace does. It wins the heart. It doesn't just inform the mind, but it does something to us. It, it produces a people of devotion. You see, the law doesn't do that. That's why we've got to be so careful of legalism. Legalism becomes rules, it becomes tasks, it, and, and basically it condemns us and we lose heart. But the grace of God wins our hearts. It justifies us, it, it declares us that we're now made righteous through the blood of Jesus. But now we belong to another, we have a new master. His name is Jesus. And we can learn to live to please him. It doesn't mean we'll be perfect. We, we still struggle with sin. We still struggle with temptation. But we're, but we're, we're, we're living to, for, in a different way. And that way is one of discipleship, actually. It's one of following the Lord, following a person. This is the grace of God. You know, this pandemic has shut down, hasn't it? As we kind of reflect on the last year, it shut down so many ways of living life. 
but it has shut down certain ways of being church. But I'm convinced of this, that there's one of the things that God's so challenging us with and, and wants to encourage our hearts with is in this, that we're not just shut down, but rather we can grow in being true followers of Jesus. In other words, keeping our hearts true to the Lord. And maybe actually God's been challenging stuff in your heart. He has with me. I, I found even this last week, I, I just was doing something and his thought came into my mind of something that happened quite a long time ago. And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. You know, it, it, it would be just a, a sinful action. And I, I just was challenged by it. I thought, hmm, I just need to do business with God on that. I believe God is at work in the heart of the church so that we become, or in our hearts, so that we become a people who remain true to the Lord. This, this is the grace of God. Please, let's not misunderstand grace. Grace isn't just a, a ticket to just do what we please. Grace is a reason to follow the Lord. It means we can follow him. And then, just what does grace look like? Well, it's forgiveness. This story really does have a remarkable twist. The chief persecutor of the church, and you could blame him for the whole, you know, kind of why some people are now in Antioch, becomes the chief servant to the church. That's grace. I just imagine what went on. Let's just use our imaginations. You know, Barnabas has this good idea. Okay, guys, you've just come to Jesus, and I know some of you had, you've lived through some difficult times, there's some stories to tell, uh, but I know someone who can really help you. <laughs> okay. They lean forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Really? Barnabas? This is such evidence of the grace of God. And it highlights forgiveness. What does the grace of God look like in our lives? What, what, what's tangible? Well, forgiveness is certainly one of those things that should be leading the pack. And yet how often we can struggle with bitterness or, or resentment. Forgiveness. Knowing we're forgiven, but as well, that ability to forgive others. Okay, just a, a couple more uh, just highlights of this church as we look around it and explore what it was like, but see what's relevant to today. How does this make almost like a model for a church of our times? Well, we see encouragement. Barnabas. The son of encouragement, renamed by the apostles in Acts chapter 4. He was called Joseph and now he's called Barnabas because he was so oozed encouragement. He was generous with finance. He was generous in trust. He trusted, he laid, you know, he, 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 he sold land. He, he laid, you know, that offering before the elders, uh, before the apostles. There was trust. He was generous in his view of others. Is generous in making room for others. We see that in his story in, uh, about, in Antioch. He's such a key person, and yet it's not about him. Okay? His heart pumps with encouragement. Oh, for more of this. We live in a very nitpicking, critical, judgmental society. You know, our society would prize the value of tolerance, and yet... To be honest, it is so intolerant, can be so intolerant in so many different ways. We need the deluge of encouragement, and I believe God wants to open the floodgates through the church. How does it come through people like you and I? Let's see ourselves as designated encouragers where we live, in our neighbourhoods, in our workplaces, in, in the settings that we influence. Let's grow in this. Let's 
cultivate a generous heart. That's the seedbed of true encouragement. But also we read that Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You see, it wasn't just a, a personality trait. It wasn't just, a, oh, you know, good old Barney. He's always a kind of, uh, he's always a, 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 a half, a glass half filled sort of guy. You know, always the optimist. No, he wasn't that. He was full of the Spirit and of faith. That gives hope for us all. He's a good man. He allowed God to do something in his heart. He wasn't carrying grudges or resentments, but the goodness of God could flow through him as he's filled with the Spirit and filled with faith. It was also a church where we see true discipleship. Barnabas and Saul, they met for a whole year with the church and they taught great numbers of people. And I guess, you know, we get insight into that teaching as we read the the epistles, really, you know, it was that same message that Paul was unpacking. These believers, they grew as disciples. That's our passion for church, that we grow as disciples. We grow as a community of disciples, a family of disciples. It's here they were first called Christians. They were identified as belonging to Christ. It could well have been a, a term of derision in those times, but we don't know. But what's interesting, it seems it is the, the label that others gave to them that they didn't give to themselves. Whereas often for us, it's the other way around. I, I, know, I know for me, it can, if I'm meeting someone and you know, we're getting to know each other, there will come that point where say, well, actually, I, I'm a Christian. And it's a, 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 a self-designated term. I can remember when I... Uh, came back to God when I was 19 at college and long haired, been a rebel and all the rest of it. And I came to Christian. One of the first things I did was I bought, I went to the Christian bookshop and bought a stick and put it on my, put it on my, oh, crash. <laughs> Just scenes of destruction here. Okay. And uh, but what happened was I put the stick on my chest and saying, yeah, Jesus saved or something. And I was designating myself, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm now a Christian. I think it's fascinating here. It seems that like others were calling them Christians. They might have been taunting them, but there was something about their lives that spoke about Christ. Let's let that be a challenge. We're called to be Christ-like. And then the final thing about this church, and it could spend much longer on this, but it had prophetic impact. Prophets arrive and Agabus predicts this famine. Fascinating, isn't it? A worldwide event, or the Roman worldwide event, that would bring hardship, suffering, poverty to many. We're living through a worldwide event that is bringing and will continue to bring suffering, hardship, poverty to many. And the church catch the prophetic heart of God. This is grace of God in action. They give generously. As they are able, they give. And they give beyond themselves. It's not just about their locality. It's beyond themselves. Into Judea. In other words, this church has prophetic impact in becoming strategic to help and care for people in times of global need. This is a church for our times. This is our vision as church. We're in such times. We believe in God. We want to be a church of word and spirit proclaiming the good news of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit in changing lives. We want to be a church characterised by the grace of God, yet we're clear in our statement of faith, but it's more than that. We want grace to be seen. We want to be a church full of encouragement. That means full of encouragers. We want to be a church 
growing as disciples together on this great mission of seeing his kingdom advance. That's why we're looking at the book of Acts. Let's pray it, let's believe it, let's give ourselves to it. God is using the events of these times, the circumstances of these times, to position us as churches to reach out and to not just make the difference, but to see his kingdom advance in people's lives. Let's be a church that acts with prophetic impact. Locally, we're doing that, but beyond the local, into just regions beyond. We're going to just have a time of just responding. I'm gonna put, we're gonna put some of these things up now that you can just respond to and just say, Lord, I wanna be part of this. Speak to me. It may be that phrase uh, where Barnabas encouraged them to remain true to the Lord. It may be there's, there's some stuff going on in your life at the moment where some battles and struggles. It may be you feel you've drifted I believe the Lord right now is calling you back. Right now. He's saying, this is what you've made for. This is what you're made for. This is what it's all about. This is the hope in these very uncertain times. Remain true to the Lord. Follow him. God's positioning us to be his answer in these times. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would be with us. We pray, Lord, we thank you that we can look back at this historic church and find it is a church for our times. And that we pray, let us be shaped by these things all these things that we've recognised. I'll pray, Lord, if there's any issues of unforgiveness in people's lives, give us grace, Lord, to settle those things. Lord, I pray, keep helping us with responding prophetically in these times that we're living in. Lord, come, root us in your grace, but let's overflow with your grace. Let's be a church of word and spirit, proclaiming Jesus and seeing the power of the Holy Spirit changing lives. Lord, just be with us now as we reflect and as we pray on these things. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Roger. Um, that was challenging. <laughs> a challenging but a comforting message. Thank you for preparing that. Thank you for bringing that to us. Um, OK, before we go, let's have one more song of uh, time of worship. Paul, lead us in one more song, please. Thank you.
Thank you, Paul. Well, as I say, that's our meeting today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking part. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Roger. And thank you for all of you behind the scenes putting this meeting together. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for being with us. And I pray that you would uh, be blessing us individually and as a church this week, in the, in the week ahead. Thank you, and uh, I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.